Hi there, my name is Bethany Kelsch. I'm an attorney at Stoll Reeves in Seattle. I spent the last several months revising the leasing forms, which included the creation of a few new forms that we'll talk about today. And in changing the leasing forms, because this is the first time they've been changed so significantly in several years, I approached the changes with an eye for practicality and flexibility in your deal making. There were three common goals throughout these revisions. The first goal was to bridge the gap between the way uh, the lease terms read and the way that a tenancy and asset actually operate. The second goal was to better manage the expectations of all the parties to the lease from deal inception or LOI stage through occupancy and through expiration and renewal. And this can include better management of expectations with regard to budgeting, whether that be tenant improvements, triple net rates, or uh, renewal rates, um, or just understanding or clarifying the rights and obligations of the parties throughout the tenancy. And the third common goal, which was kind of the overarching goal, was to reduce the overall conflict and confusion throughout negotiations and throughout the tenancy, all the way through expiration or renewal of the term. The most significant change that we'll start by talking about today was the addition of the work letter as Exhibit B or Exhibit C, depending on which form that you're using. And the reason why I want to start by talking about that today is because the addition of the work letter drove a lot of the other substantive changes throughout the leasing forms. After we walk through the work letter, we're going to discuss each of the clauses that the work letter impacted. These are the clauses that you're going to want to be mindful of relative to the substance of the TIs and relative to the terms and conditions of the work letter. Note that I may not refer to a particular section number as I walk through these clauses. This is because as you're moving through the leasing forms, each leasing form is going to have a different substance and the section numbers may not align. I will try to use consistent, consistent section numbers where they apply, but if I'm not using a section number, that's why. So the goals of the work letter were to raise the TI planning discussion as early on in the negotiation as possible. The, also, the goal of the work letter was to clarify the rights and obligations of the parties throughout TI planning, as well as throughout uh, the actual performance of the tenant and improvements. So what does the work letter provide? What you were used to seeing was kind of a free field exhibit. I believe it was exhibit C. And there was the, the form was bifurcated into work to be completed by landlord and work to be completed by tenant. But there was no infrastructure around what that looked like. So now what we've done is we've filled in some infrastructure and some terms and conditions around who is performing the work and how that work is to be performed. We've maintained the allocation of landlord's work and tenant's work in the work letter. However, now we've memorialized two mechanisms, both a turnkey improvement mechanism and a planned improvement mechanism. In the first section, you will see that the work to be completed by landlord, and this is only with respect to landlord's work, and note that this first section that memorializes turnkey and planned improvements is going to be the same for section two, which memorializes the work to be completed by tenant. So what you'll see here is two option boxes. The first is the work is to be completed as identified below. And you'll see several categories of turnkey improvements that you can choose as applicable and also a free form field for you to write in or specify what the scope of that work might be. The second option box states as mutually agreed upon between landlord and tenant as follows. This is the box you're going to want to check if the tenant improvements are going to be planned, whether or not that requires permits, drawings, etc. So the subsequent sections after this box set forth a TI planning process as between landlord and tenant. These, the same infrastructure or comparable infrastructure is set forth in section two with respect to completion of tenant's work. Moving down the work letter with respect to performance of tenant's work by tenant, subsection B imposes conditions on performance of tenant's work. You'll notice that there are four new option boxes. These are not requirements. These are areas where you can, you can raise and discuss with your client as to what may be applicable for your particular landlord or might, what might be applicable, applicable for the particular scope of work. Section three clarifies the scope of any tenant improvement allowance and what it may be used for. You'll see in section three, three new option boxes. The first box is for you to set forth what the TI allowance is in a price per square foot as it is to be applied to landlord's work or tenant's work. 
there's also a freeform field for you to write in what scope of work may be accepted from the TI allowance. In other words, what the TI allowance is not to apply to. The second option box is no TI allowance and allocates all cost and expense to tenant for performance of tenant's work. And lastly, the last option box is again, no TI allowance and allocates all cost and expense to landlord for completion of tenant's work. Except for, again, there is a free form field for you to accept out what landlord is not responsible for and also add a not to exceed number at the end of the clause. Section four clarifies the ownership of improvements and the removal obligations at term termination or expiration. So you will see that section four is an optional box. Note that because that will become important when we talk about other lease provisions that deal with alterations in tenant improvements. Section four states that the following scope of tenant's work either A, shall become the property of landlord, or B, shall be removed by tenant at its sole cost and expense. This clause also provides a free form field for you to specify exactly which scope of improvements is either to become the property of landlord or is to be removed by tenant at its sole cost and expense. This is gonna become important for you to coordinate with other areas of the lease because what you put in here as what is going to be removed by tenant or is going to become the property of landlord is going to wanna to be consistent with the other areas of the lease that deal with alterations in tenant improvements. So that summarizes what the new work letter provides. And now we're gonna talk about the six other areas of the lease that you're going to be, want to be mindful of and that you're gonna want your client to be mindful of and make sure that these, these provisions are consistent. This is gonna reduce conflict and, and reduce confusion throughout ultimately what is going to be your client's tenancy. So what are the implications on, of the work letter on the remaining lease provisions? And we're gonna start at the top with lease commencement dates. What you're used to seeing for lease commencement dates is one option, which is insertion of a date certain upon which the lease will commence. Now what we've done is we've added two options. You can still insert a date certain, but we've created some flexibility and you also have an option for the lease to commence upon substantial completion of either landlord's or tenant's work and also put a not to exceed date for lease commencement. The implications of these changes, again, are consistency with the work letter. So things that you can think through to make sure that your substantial completion date makes sense or that selection of a substantial completion lease commencement date makes sense is what is the scope of the TIs? Who is, who is actually performing the TIs? Are there permits that are going to need to be involved? Think through those issues and make sure that whatever you're choosing as far as a lease commencement date makes sense for your client. In tandem with choosing a substantial completion lease commencement date is being mindful of the delayed possession clause. In the delayed possession clause, we're, we're basically stating that if landlord is unable to complete landlord's work by a substantial completion date, that tenant gets some election of remedies. So what this clause now does is it raises a discussion between you and your client. First, you're gonna to wanna to discuss how long the delay period can be before triggering tenant's remedies. As you can see here, the default amount of delay period will be 60 days unless you fill in another period of time. Then you're going to have to decide if landlord's work exceeds whatever date or whatever amount of time you've put in for your delay period, which election of remedies makes sense for your client. And you have two options. First is cancellation of the lease, and the second is a per diem abatement of base rent and additional rent. The next area that we're gonna want to be mindful of with regard to the work letter is the utilities and services section. Now I know I said in the beginning that the changes we're discussing were, our, were to all the leasing forms, but with respect to the utilities and service clause, the leasing forms for a single tenant triple net uh, or a single tenant base year lease and the sublease were different because of the way in which utilities and serv services operate differently within those contexts. So as you'll see in this section, there were option, option boxes inserted for all applicable landlord provided utilities and services that will be billed as operating costs. We've distinguished those operating costs from those utilities and services that are direct billed to tenant or are separately metered. This is where you're gonna to wanna to think about consistency with the work letter. How are the various utilities and services or the availability or lack of avail availability thereof going to impact the scope of your TIs? 
if, for example, your client needs a utility service that the landlord is not going to provide, who is responsible for, for performance of that work? Who is responsible for procuring a submeter? And how might that fluctuate your substantial completion dates and the scope of your tenant improvements? Now, referring back to section four of the work letter where we talked about tenants' obligations with respect to removal of its improvements or whether those improvements become the property of landlord at the end of the tenancy, in the alteration section, which is the next section that we're going to talk about, um, we have distinguished what an alteration is. Again, capital A alteration. This is a defined term within these leases. Uh, from tenants' work, capital T for tenants' work, and also from signage. Signage is now going to be a defined term, and we'll talk about that in a second. It's just going to be its own beast, and the allocation of rights and responsibilities for that is going to be uh, a, a standalone provision. But we, we've distinguished these. What you'll see in this clause is that landlord's consent is still required for all alterations. But with respect to alterations that either do not affect the structural components of the premises or the utility systems in the premises, or otherwise are under $10,000, landlord's consent must not be unreasonably withheld, conditioned, or delayed. We've also created a mechanism for you to ask for landlord's consent to alterations and a process by which you exchange um, in writing your request for alterations and landlord's consent thereto. With respect to the removal of your alterations and improvements, if you move down through the clause, you'll see that there are new option boxes. And going back to ensuring consistency with the work letter, you'll see the phrase begin, except as provided in the work letter, and you have two new option boxes. The first option is that tenants' work or improvements or alterations, A, become the property of landlord, or B, shall be removed by tenant at its sole cost and expense. The nuance here to be aware of in the parenthetical is that these options might be modified unless landlord conditions its consent in writing upon tenant leaving a specified alteration at the premises, in which case tenant shall not remove the alteration and it should become the property of landlord. So you're really going to want to make sure that your work letter in section four and your two option boxes in, in the alteration section, depending on which lease you're in, are consistent. As I mentioned when talking about alterations, signage is now its, no, its own operative term with a capital S. In the signage section, we've parsed signage from alterations and tenant improvements, and we've allocated full responsibility for installation of the improvements, removal of the improvements, and any necessary restoration as a result of the removement at all costs and expenses to the tenant, again, unless as otherwise stated in the work letter. The next section that we're going to talk about is the lien section. Now, this clause wasn't changed too substantively, but the one thing that you want to be aware of is that landlord was removed from the lien release process. So practically speaking, the way in which a lien happens is that either landlord or tenant perform work, it doesn't get paid for, and the property or the premises or the improvements itself get liened. Now, landlord will no longer accept or be required to post a lien release bond on tenant's behalf. Tenant must remove the lien or procure and record a bond on its own behalf, but it still may dispute its validity. This is going to be of increased importance to your tenants who are performing a substantial amount of TIs, and it may help you rethink whether or not it's the tenant itself that's going to want to do the performance of the TIs. So that summarizes the changes that are driven by the work letter. And we've now discussed all the provisions that you're going to be, want to be mindful of or at least discuss with, your, discuss with your client as you're moving through negotiations. So the next changes that we're going to discuss are other significant changes to the leasing forms, but these weren't necessarily driven by the work letter, but are still important and of note. First is the casualty and condemnation clause. There weren't any substantive changes to this clause per se. However, the clauses were made consistent in their language throughout the leasing forms. We noticed that there was a few discrepancies throughout the way in which the language read, and we just cleaned that up a little bit and made them consistent, but there weren't any actual substantive changes to these sections. The next major change is with respect to tenant's liability insurance. What you were used to seeing in the form before was a 30-day notice of cancellation requirement, meaning if tenant's policy was going to be canceled, that they needed to deliver notice of that cancellation to the landlord within 30 days. What we've done is we've extended that to a 45-day notice. 
And the reason why we did that is because there is a Washington state law on point for this issue that actually requires the insurance carrier to notify the insured within 45 days of cancellation of a policy. So we've made this clause consistent with that statute. Also with respect to tenant's liability insurance, we have changed or I guess increased the burden of identifying landlord as an additional insured. So before the way that this worked is typically you delivered some form of a court form that simply identified landlord as an additional insured or any other parties that landlord uh, might designate such as their property manager. Now what we've done is actually required you to deliver an additional insured endorsement, which is just different than, a, than a, a typical certificate identifying landlord on its face. And you'll see that change in the tenant's liability in insurance section. With respect to tenant's property insurance, and note that this change that I'm about to discuss is only with respect to the single tenant triple net lease. Before this clause was silent as to who carried insurance for the actual building structure of the premises or the building in which the premises are located. So we filled in that gap and we've allocated that responsibility to the landlord. However, we've also allowed the landlord to bill back that cost to the tenant as additional rent, as additional rent is paid as set forth elsewhere in the lease. Next are the default provisions and starting with default provisions relative to tenant's default. With respect to other non-monetary default section, the non-monetary default period used to be 30 days, meaning if tenant did not clear its breach within 30 days, then arguably a default was incurred. Now what we've done is said, provided that tenant is diligently pursuing a cure of their default in a period that is not longer than 60 days, they're in compliance with this clause. Similarly, in the failure to take possession clause or default that is incurred as a result of the tenant failure, failing to take possession of the premises, instead of a default being incurred for a mere passage of time, now what we've done is we've obligated the landlord to send a five-day notice of the tenant's failure to take possession before a default is incurred. So moving on down the default provisions where we're discussing landlord's default, We've similarly afforded landlord a diligent cure period. So just as tenant now gets an extra 30 days to cure its breach of the lease, landlord similarly gets that 30-day period to diligently pursue a cure of its breach. The next clause we're going to discuss is the holdover provision. This is also not a clause that was changed very significantly, but what we did do is we clean up the language to better describe what a holdover tenancy is. So where you're used to seeing that holding over of the premises without the consent of landlord constitutes a month-to-month -month tenancy, the month-to-month -month language was changed to a tenancy at sufferance, which may be terminated according to Washington law. This is because Washington law defines a tenancy at sufferance and the terms and conditions upon which such tenancy can be terminated. It's important to note that a tenancy at sufferance means that all the terms and conditions of the lease apply, not just that it's a month-to-month -month, month -month term. And finally, probably my favorite change of, the, of all the lease forms is to the notices provision. And we have removed fax transmission as a method of notice. So the clause remains the same. Just note that notice is no longer given via fax transmission given our modern times. The next important change to be mindful of is in the hazardous materials clause. And what we've done is we've tempered landlord's representation and warranty and tenant's obligations with regard to existence of hazardous materials on the premises. The language of this clause now contemplates regulatory thresholds of hazardous materials. So with respect to landlord's representation and warranty that there are no hazardous materials on the premises, we've tempered this so that the representation and warranty is of landlord's actual knowledge of hazardous materials that are in excess of reportable quantities. Moving down the clause to tenant's obligations with regard to not bringing hazardous materials on the premises, now the clause contemplates that tenant is not to bring hazardous materials onto the premises except in de minimis quantities that are typical of the permitted use. When we say de minimis quantities that are, that are typical of the permitted use, we're talking about things like household cleaners or office supplies that may have hazardous materials, but we're not trying to put tenant in breach of the lease or put them in default for having those within their premises. 
So the next clause we're going to discuss is the force majeure clause. We're not going to talk about the force majeure clause in the context of COVID or the coronavirus, but we did as, add language to this clause to contemplate that the market is now bearing rent deferral arrangements or rent abatement arrangements. So what this clause now does is it still states what the force majeure events may be and that there may be deferred performance under the lease. However, in the very last se sentence, we, we say that the force majeure event in no way operates to extend the term of the lease. So if you're going to come to some amendment or some alternative arrangement, make sure that you either alter this clause or make sure that your amendment contemplates the fact that there is an extension of the term or no extension of the term. And we're almost done with the changes to all the leasing forms. And we are going to talk about a clause that's important to everyone that's listening here today, which is the commission clause. The commission clause was not changed very significantly, but what we did do is make the language consistent between paragraph two of the commission clause and paragraph three of the commission clause. Paragraph two of the commission clause sets forth all the ways in which a commission may become due, whether that be expansion of the premises or extension of the term. However, in paragraph three, where it describes the way in which and the timing of payment of that commission, it omitted expansion of the premises. So we've added language to address how a payment of commission upon expansion of the premises is paid to make it consistent with paragraph two. And lastly, note that the notary block has changed and all you need to know is that it's much simpler and it's the abbreviated statutory form. Now we're going to discuss form specific changes and we're going to start with the retail form, retail triple net form. If you move to section 4G, where the definition of gross sales records is described, you'll notice that we've relaxed the definition of, sa of gross sales records. What I mean by relax is that this provision used to be a lot longer and there used to be a laundry list of things that described what a gross sales records did. Now we just basically describe gross sales records as the way in which gross sales are defined in the preceding clause. So similarly, with respect to section 4H, which is gross sales statements, we didn't change this clause substantively. We just cleaned up the language a bit. It was a little unclear, and the substance of it really didn't make sense. And so you'll notice that the clause reads a little bit, a little bit clearer so that everybody's on the same page with what a gross sales statement is, what its impact is, and what it's due. So I'm going to move us down to section six, which is the uses clause. And the last two paragraphs of this clause talk about prohibited uses and also a radius restriction. So if you look at the second to last paragraph of section six, where it describes all of the prohibited uses, whether that be the handling or sale of alcoholic beverages, whether it be a warehouse or storage facility, each of these itemized prohibited uses are now an option. What this means is, is that these are not blanket prohibitions. You can now raise a discussion with the landlord and raise a discussion with the tenant and choose which of these makes the most sense for the project. In the last paragraph, which discusses the radius restriction, we've provided the same flexibility. You'll notice that there's an option box that precedes the entire paragraph and it says check if applicable. What this indicates is that there is no blanket default radius restrictions. This is now a negotiable point and it may not be applicable or make sense for the project. And now it's a point that you can discuss with the landlord and the tenant accordingly. And for clarity, a radius restriction is a prohibition on tenant operating a same or similar business within three miles of the premises. So again, this is part of the goal of making more practical and flexible terms in your negotiations. So now we're going to talk about the sublease form, which I hear is in high demand, so we revised that along with all of the other leasing forms. Turning you to Section 7, Additional Charges, note that we've allocated the responsibility for utilities and those utilities that are beyond what is already available or billed to the tenant in the master lease. And we've allocated that responsibility to the subtenant. So we've allocated the responsibility for those utilities to the subtenant. So what this means is, is that if the existing utilities and services under the master lease are not sufficient or different from what the subtenant needs, the subtenant is going to be responsible for the installation or provision of those services. Moving you to section eight, alterations. We've already talked about alterations and how we've distinguished capital A alterations from tenant's work or other improvements. 
And the sublease did also get treated with those changes. However, notice that there are no option boxes as in the other leasing forms at the bottom of this clause. So the default position will be that any alterations or improvements that are made by the subtenant must be removed by the subtenant at the end of the term. And a really important clause that we changed is the very last clause of the sublease, and that is landlord's consent to the sublease, which takes the form of Section 24. What you're, you were used to seeing in this was a form of what we call like a landlord estoppel. And basically what that is is landlord acknowledging that at the time that the tenant and the subtenant entered into the sublease, that the tenant was in compliance with all of the lease terms. You would usually see that more in an assignment context, not necessarily in a sublease context. So we remove that concept from this clause. You will also see that the line regarding tenant's compliance from the lease is no longer in here, along with the fact that tenant and subtenant are jointly and severally acknowledging to be bound to the terms of the sublease and the master lease. And I'm really excited to talk about the new forms that we've created, which include new letters of intent. So for those of you who use the SEBA letter of intent before, you'll know that it was kind of a free field form and it didn't necessarily align with the rest of the terms of the lease. So what we've done was we've created an LOI per each type of lease form that you're using. And again, going back to the goals that we discussed at the beginning of the presentation, we're trying to better manage the expectations of the parties from deal inception through negotiation of the lease term and into, into occupancy renewal. So by creating the LOI form that better aligns with the lease form, the LOI is going to better translate into the lease form once you start discussing the specific terms. So there are six new letters of intent, and they include the multi-tenant triple net letter of intent, the triple net retail letter of intent, a single tenant triple net letter of intent, a multi-tenant basier letter of intent, a multi-tenant gross letter of intent, and a single tenant gross letter of intent. So all the new LOI forms have been disseminated to the brokerage community, and you'll see that they're pretty self-explanatory. It's either a checkbox or a fill in the blank, but if you do have any questions about those new LOIs or the way in which they translate into the, the leasing forms as the leasing forms have been revised, please feel free to reach out to SEBA. And you probably heard me mention that there was a new base year LOI, and that's because we've created a new base year form. So if you look at the old form, we used to have two option boxes depending on the method of payment being used, whether that's a base year accounting mechanism or a triple net accounting mechanism. We have now created a new standalone base year form that is separate from and distinct from the multi-tenant triple net lease. I'm going to move us to talking about all of the riders and addenda, and yes, there are changes to all of them. And the first that we're going to talk about are the option to extend rider and the rent rider. And the reason why I want to talk about those two together is because the way in which the rent rider was changed is such that if you do not complete the rent rider in full for both the existing term and the extended term, the option to extend rider will govern what the renewal rental rate is at the fair market value as the fair market value is determined in the option to extend rider. So this is another area that you're gonna to wanna to ensure that either some coordination and consistency if we're gonna use both of those riders. So turning you to the rent rider, it now provides a rent schedule and it also provides a CPI increase, but for both the existing term and the extended term. So now it allows you an opportunity to determine what the extended term rental rate will be upfront. Turning you to the option to extend rider, it still provides for a market rate mechanism, but provides that the market rent will not be less than the base rent last payable at the expiration of the term. Be aware of what fair market means in the option rider, however. We've imposed a floor, meaning when I said that the base rent payable upon the extended term will not be less than the base rent payable upon expiration of the preceding term, we've imposed a limit, meaning whatever fair market value is, it cannot be lower than the rent that was last payable. So make sure that you note that nuance and make sure that both of your clients are aware of it. Now we'll discuss the retail use rider. 
And if you remember, what the retail use writer used to say at the very top as a preliminary provision is it called out that sections 9 through 14 are only applicable if landlord leases to more than one tenant. Because there was some ambiguity in what that actually indicates, we've annotated sections 9 through 14 to state that sections 9 through 14 only apply if the property is multi-tenant. It's a more industry standard term and hopefully gives more meaning to whether or not those provisions are applicable. With respect to the parking rider, you'll probably notice that this form changed rather significantly. And it's because we wanted to build some infrastructure around what the various parking options at market might be and clarify the rights and obligations surrounding those options. So turning to section one, option box number one, this clause discusses rented parking or parking for which the landlord charges a monthly, monthly fee and it talks about parking on a reserved and unreserved basis. Box two talks about free parking, and box three states that there is no parking. With respect to reserved rented parking, we've inserted a landlord enforcement mechanism. However, landlord is only required to enforce reserved parking after five days during which tenant is unable to access its parking. With respect to unreserved parking at a fee, or rented but unreserved parking, we've limited tenants' allocation of stalls to tenants pro rata share. Additionally, you'll notice at the end of this clause that we've stated that parking rights are non-assignable. This is pre pretty standard in the market, that any sort of special concessions generally are not assignable, such as parking. With respect to free parking, note that tenants' amount or allocated amount of spaces is subject to tenants pro rata share. And section two of the parking rider, which is miscellaneous provisions, we've inserted uh, flexibility for the landlord to either change the configuration of the parking or maybe possibly temporarily close the parking uh, structure or the parking lot, whether that be for maintenance or repairs, et cetera. And we've limited their liability for doing so and stated that if landlord reconfigures or has to close down the parking lot for any reason, that it's not going to warrant an abatement of rent, and it's also not going to put landlord in default of the lease. Now we're going to talk about the guarantee of tenant's obligations rider. And generally, you'll see that this entire rider is pretty much the same. Uh, we'll talk about some of the nuances to section two, but you will notice it's a little bit lengthier because we've added three new provisions that we're going to discuss. So turning you to section two, you'll notice a phrase toward the end of this clause that says, this is a guarantee of payment and performance and not of collection. And what that means is if the tenant defaults or breaches the lease, the guarantor shall perform tenant's obligations on tenant's behalf without any further notice or demand from the landlord. And that the landlord does not need to exhaust its remedies against the tenant before pursuing the guarantor. Basically what this important language says is that if there is more than one guarantor, all of those guarantors are equally bound to their obligations under this guarantee. And if there is more than one of them, that landlord can choose to pursue one or all of them in any order landlord so chooses. I mentioned earlier that the rider looks a little bit longer than you're used to, and that's because we added three new provisions, and they're really minor, so I'll walk through each of those briefly and they are financial statements, notices, and governing law. With respect to financial statements, this basically requires the guarantor to provide financial statements to landlord at landlord's request, and also, upon the request of landlord, ratify the obligations of the guarantor under the guarantee. We've also added a notice provision such that if a notice is required to be given under the guarantee, there's a mechanism or instructions on how to do that. But note that the notice provision under the guarantee is different from the notice provision that you see in the lease as between landlord and tenant. We've also added a governing law provision, and the governing law provision also includes a choice of venue provision. What this means is, is if there was ever a dispute and the parties were to go to court, that the laws of the state of Washington would apply to interpreting or enforcing this guarantee, and that the, any sort of claim or enforcement of the guarantee will be, will be brought only in the county in which the premises are situated. However, also note that if for some reason a judgment is rendered somewhere else in another venue, 
that the guarantor will be bound by that judgment and stipulates to the fact that it will be bound by that judgment in this section. Turning to the letter of credit rider. Now, the changes to the letter of credit rider were not super significant. However, the revisions are meaningful. So I want to walk through what these revisions do as far as impacting the rights and obligations under the lease. The bottom of section one, you'll notice a phrase that talks about delivery of the letter of credit as a condition to tenants' rights and a condition to landlords' obligations under the lease. The operative language being that the lease is strictly contingent on tenant causing the letter of credit to remain in full force and effect during the entire, entire term of the lease. Also notice that landlord now has a right to approve the form of the letter of credit that is acceptable to landlord. So the takeaway from these changes for the broker is that the form of the letter of credit and delivery of that letter of credit to landlord is a really important component to execution of the lease. Now I'm going to turn us to section three, which is draws on the letter of credit, and we're going to talk about three components that were revised in this section. The first component is that landlord's draw on a letter of credit does not constitute an advance payment due under the lease. What this means is, is that in the unlikely event that the landlord has to draw on a letter of credit, landlord's receipt of those funds is aside from the charges that your tenant has to pay under the lease, and they still should be paying those. The second component is that if landlord is delayed on their drawing of letter of credit, landlord's delay in drawing on that letter of credit will not indicate a waiver of landlord's right to do so. What this means is that there's a concept in the law that basically says that if you continuously fail to exercise a right, or if there's a delay in you exercising your right, that you're indicating that you're waiving your right to do so. Inserting this language is such that you are maintaining landlord's right to draw on the letter of credit, even if there's an event of delay. So the third component is a limitation of landlord's liability for drawing on a letter of credit in an automatic bankruptcy stay setting. What this clause says is that landlord will not be liable for any indirect, consequential, special, or punitive damages incurred by tenant if landlord violates the automatic stay and draws on the letter of credit. So it's important to understand what a bankruptcy stay is. A bankruptcy stay happens when a debtor files for bankruptcy and the court says that its creditors are not allowed to pursue that debtor any further for collections. It's a protection for the debtor. So what this language is intended to do is to limit landlord's liability if it is drawing on that le letter of credit when there is a bankruptcy stay in place. So the last of what we're going to talk about today are the listing agreements. And the changes were to the exclusive lease listing agreement and the exclusive agency lease listing agreement. Note that the changes that I'm going to talk about were largely the same between those two forms, so I'm going to talk about them in the collective. The first change is that we move the definition section up to the top of the form and we clarify the definition of a lease the definition of a tenant or lessee, and the definition of a sale or what it means to sell the subject property. Conceptually, these terms mean the same thing that you're used to, but we just clarified their definitions. Where you insert the rental rate and term, we've added a line to insert other lease terms and conditions that may be material to your client in accepting an offer. In section five, we've made it more clear that this section pertains to the owner's representations and warranties with respect to the information they give you as their agent. Additionally, the clause no longer refers to the term information pages attached to the agreement as containing the property information that the owner is warranting. Rather, the clause has been made more broad to state that generally all property information given by the owner during this agreement is subject to the warranty under this clause. Section six is an important one because it sets forth the triggering events for when a commission is due, but we've changed this paragraph. There are three significant changes. First was that the definition of affiliate was moved up in the clause from the second paragraph to the first paragraph, and the definition was also clarified to state that an affiliate is an entity that owns or controls more than 10% owner ownership or voting interest in such entity. The second change is with respect to subsection D. 
the event in which the owner makes the property untenable by its voluntary act. Now a commission is due following an owner's voluntary or negligent act or voluntary or negligent failure to act. And lastly, we've added an optional section to set forth how a commission is to be calculated and an option to state that a commission is not due for any transfer of the property, notwithstanding the rest of the terms of the agreement. And last changes to the listing agreements are with respect to Section 7. We've made it clear that Section 7 includes a disclaimer of liability for SEBA as a multiple listing service. The pertinent language being in all caps, stating that SEBA has no duty to investigate the listed information and assumes no responsibility for third-party reliance on the information or their dissemination of that information. Also be aware that we removed an unnecessary and rather confusing statement that preceded the all caps language, which said that regardless of whether a cooperating member is the firm of the lessee, the owner, neither or both, the member shall be entitled to receive the selling office's share of the commission as designated by the listing office. Again, this statement is no longer in this clause, and this statement is also nowhere else in this form. So the sublease largely mirrors all of the other terms and conditions of the listing agreements, only it's just with respect to the sublease interest, and it's subject to the master lease, and does not contemplate a sale or other transfer of the property. That concludes our discussion about all the changes to the leasing forms, as well as the creation of the new letters of intent, the new base year form, and the sublease listing agreement. Note, though, that we didn't go over every single change today. The goal of today's discussion was to hit on a high level what the most significant changes were and to elaborate on what they mean and why those changes were made. Given that there were, a, there were a creation of a few new forms and we didn't really discuss those in too much depth today, please feel free to reach out to SEBA with any questions on how to complete those forms or how to use them. Thank you so much for taking the time to walk through the leasing form changes with me today. Hopefully you found, as I did, that the new forms create more flexibility in your deal making and better address your clients' goals and objectives overall.